Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar hosted by the Organization Development and Change Workforce Education and Development Program at Penn State. This is a monthly webinar series presented during your lunch hour. My name is Yu Ling Chang. I am a PhD candidate in Workforce Education and Development Program at Penn State University. We also have Sakun Giri, who is the moderator for Q&A session. In terms of the interactive format for this webinar, please use the chat feature in the Zoom platform. If you have any questions about the presentation, please use Q&A feature on Zoom. You can see the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. The Q&A session will be at the end of the presentation. Our online Master of Professional Studies in Organization Development and Change are designed for professionals who need the skills and knowledge to effectively lead change in their organization. Furthermore, there is a PhD program in Workforce Education and Development with a concentration in Human Resource Development and Organization Development. Our program has created a continuous monthly webinar series with experts around the world. Today, we are presenting Humanizing the Work Environment, an OD mandate presented by Dr. Christine Mashbray. Dr. Mashbray has an excellent record in academic and institutional leadership, having served in a leadership in a number of institutions in England and Zambia. She earned her doctorate from the University of Hardersonfield in UK and has made an impact as a professional in higher education, winning the prestigious award of Africa's Most Influential Woman in Business and Government by CEO Global in 2017, 2018, and 2019. She currently was awarded the GARA's Award of Excellence for Global Leaders for her contributions to social welfare towards the betterment of the society and country. Her focus is on leadership and organization de effectiveness, organization development, human resource management, female education, and Zambia traditions. Now, please join me in welcoming our speaker today. Dr. Mashbray, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And welcome to everybody that has managed to tune in. I think it's always exciting to have such kind of forums uh, where so much uh, ideas actually uh, emerge. And I'm sure from the uh, title of the webinar uh, this afternoon, I think uh, from the point of view from where it's being hosted, it's uh, actually in the night from here. Uh, I'm calling it the humanizing the work environment, which is an OD or an organization development mandate. And this is very, very important. And I just hope that uh, from this presentation and towards the end, uh, and even during the presentation, we are going to have uh, some, some moment of uh, just um, asking each other questions and uh, being able to respond. And in the process of the discussions, I'm sure that uh, um, some good ideas are going to emerge uh, from that. And uh, from the slide that you are seeing, I'm sure you've been able to see uh, the kind of a structure that I'm going to follow this evening. We can move. We can move the slide. Okay. So I just want to give a brief background to how I ended up, uh, you know, getting into this whole concept of humanizing the work environment. In 2021, UNICAF University partnered with Transform Your Performance, uh, which is USA based, uh, together with Center for Organization Leadership and Development in Zimbabwe to run a number of dialogues with different individuals uh, from various sectors on a topic entitled practical integration of employees in an organization as a performance strategy. So consultants from USA, uh, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Zambia, and other places, Canada as well, inclusive, um, came together. And this included leaders, managers, and employees at different levels in organizations uh, who took part in this uh, dialogue. And it trained for several weeks. Humanizing the human, um, the human was born. 
and the publication that took into consideration the various issues uh, critically discussed to understand the most practical means of integrating employees in, a, in any organization. So this webinar is really based on these dialogues from which emerged real insights and ideas that confirm that humanizing a work environment as an organization development mandate is actually crucial. And so hence the compilation of this webinar uh, this afternoon. We can move on. So looking at the concept of humanizing the work environment, and I'm sure you're going to agree with me that uh, it may sound like it's one of those uh, current topics that are under debate quite a lot, but you, if you are in human resource management development and organization development, you will agree with me that uh, it, it, it's got its own history uh, from the mechanistic uh, kind of you know, theory that uh, um, Taylor actually was using, where there was the shift now from that particular uh, period to one where humans began being considered as important, as crucial, and that they are supposed to be treated as human beings. And that kind of background, I think, has evolved and it has continued. And up to this current stage where there is a lot of debate, which has also been necessitated by the COVID pandemic, because then people went back to work from home. You know, the, the work from home uh, strategies that were used or remote working, you know, and, and all that. And as a result, it seems like the, the individuals realized and awoke to the fact that we are humans and I think we need to be treated as humans. And so human is, humanizing the work environment is about seeing the human in each and every employee. So with today's use of artificial intelligence uh, for talent management, humanizing the work environment becomes something that is quite crucial. And so I'm sure we are all well aware of what is going on in terms of uh, the importance or the value of uh, artificial intelligence, which is a very good innovation. And I'm sure we have seen the contributions that it has already contributed to our work environment. But you see, the problem is that there, is, there are issues to do with categorizing you know, and uh, uh, categorizing individuals, you know, into uh, these groups, you know, and, 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 and keywords. And therefore it is not enough, you know, it doesn't give that enough room for individuality and distinctive uniqueness, which is so crucial to a human being. So when you are categorizing individuals, that kind of uh, process tends to reinforce uh, such kind of affinity groups, you know, like, to do with skin color, ethnicity, or gender, if I may be able to uh, allowed to mention that a few. And, and it also tends to lead to loss, to lose sight of the individual and as well as the human essence at the end of it all. And what we have is where humans are then dehumanized. So, you know, human uniqueness honors our desire for individualization, for expressing our best self, as humans and for fulfilling our potential, for aligning what we do with our, our passions, our purpose and our unique life path. I teach human resource management, human resource uh, development in a number of universities uh, here in Zambia. And I've taught it also uh, in England as well as in China. You know, um, and, and in my teaching, one of the things that we, we tend to sort of like bring out, you know, like especially when you start with the recruitment part of it is you, you advertise a job. And because you've seen that there's a, there's a vacancy, you know, for that particular job. And when we do the advertisement, the people that see those advertisements you know, somehow because of the, the skills they have, the knowledge that they have, they are able to say, I, am, I think I'm a capable individual to apply for this particular job. job or oh, I am the best person on that this is that you know when these individuals turn up for interviews we don't see the qualifications we don't see the the, the the knowledge we don't see the skills wobbling through the doors of these organizations what we see are individuals so the employers begin to see a face of a human being not necessarily these uh, things they were looking out for when they put up the advert, like, you know, the skills, the knowledge and all that. They see an individual and there begins 
the job of ensuring that we humanize an individual and treat them as human beings. I've been on a lot of panels and sometimes these interviews can actually be uh, a place where humans are de uh, dehumanized. So what I'm asking is as humans, we are all naturally inclusive. So why are we putting up humans into categories? I think this is a very, very important uh, question that each one of us should begin to ask themselves as we move on with this presentation. So I'm saying humanizing is the manifestation of people's inalienable human rights, people's innate human nature, as well as the manifestation of people's natural abilities as a whole person. And this is supported by, uh, in fact, uh, noted by Patrick Trotter, 2020, 2012. Humanizing the work environment is about seeing these individual employees. You know, you are seeing their unique geniuses. You are seeing their talents. You are seeing their personal strengths and their passions. And we don't consider this for the organization. But these human beings that have walked through the doors of our organizations are supposed to be allowed to work with the organization to ensure that their unique genius their talents, their personal strength and passions are brought to the table. And they are seen as humans who are very important in, the, in ensuring that they are able to exercise and use these skills, these talents and the knowledge that they have to the betterment of the organization. We can move on. And so I've got a case study here. Um, I don't know, I'm going to allow you to just read it. And after we do that, uh, the most important thing that I want us to do is to look at some of the questions that have been raised uh, that are linked to this uh, uh, case study. A smile costs nothing. And I will try to read it quickly, probably for everybody. Uh, it says, Mr. James worked for a known company in Zambia as a general worker. Cleaning was a task that he claimed he knew very well, but he really did a job, a good job. They are walked past where he was cleaning and point out his shoddy work. It was met with complaints and insults. He was not the friendliest guy around. Unfortunately, it was not him alone. The manager of the company was not different from Mr. James. He would come in late, walk past everyone without a greeting. Any greeting was met with a grin. Individuals rarely frequented the manager's office for anything, af afraid of a reprimand or nothing at all. At meeting, at meetings, the manager talked for a long time as few dared to contribute or respond to his questions. It was clear the manager lacked people skills. One day the manager arrived at the company and met Mr. James cleaning at the entrance. Mr. James stopped swinging his mop, afraid it had gone on the manager's shoes. He began to apologize right away, but the manager stopped. Mr. James, he started, how are you? Myself, Mr. James asked it confused, but continued, boss is me. I'm very well, thanking you. And how are you, sir? He answered in his best English as he used to claim to other workers. I went to school also, but my uncle could not sponsor me, so I could, I could not continue. But English, I can speak it. As the manager walked away, Mr. James remained wondering as to what had just happened. He stopped to greet me. He wondered asking himself the same question over and over again. We can move to the next slide. Good morning, everybody. It is a good morning and we should greet each other. That was Mr. James now. While others laughed and responded, others wondered at what had happened to Mr. James and the manager. However, Mr. James went on to clean the offices with a smile whistling all the time. The corners he never cleaned were cleaned that day. He left for home a very happy man. He got home, greeted his wife for the very first time and asked her to ensure that his best clothes be cleaned, ironed because he needed to dress smart at work the following day. The wife could not believe what was going on. She thought he had just had a pay rise, but to her surprise, here was his response. The boss greeted me today. He never greets anyone, but today he stopped and greeted me with a nice smile. I can't be greeting the boss in dirty clothes. I will dress clean and do my best to clean the place so that my boss appreciates me. So it was to the surprise of everyone. From that day onward, Mr. James was a changed man. His work culture and attitude changed. The manager was who changed his attitude, changed his worker to a better person too. He took a smile and a greeting. It did not have to raise the wage of Mr. James. He was recognized as a human being worthy of attention. And so I've got some questions. Uh, probably this could be uh, asked and then we can contribute 
uh, I think based on this uh, case study. So you can go to the chat room. I think uh, there should be some questions there. One of them being that explain the implications of one human act on how much um, on how much does it cost to one act to one to act human. You could raise your hand or you could uh, put your, your answer in the chat box. So use the chat to respond to the question. That's very good, behaving cordially to others costs nothing but can make a huge difference in helping people feel human. That's a very good one. Any other? That's very good, the only cost is time. Please don't know how to approach you. I mean, people don't know how to approach you. Sometimes we don't realize the impact we have on others, which is very, very good, you know. And, and we need to ask ourselves, why don't we realize, you know, why don't we realize this? Why is it difficult to realize that? Any other? There is no cost yet impacts everyone greatly. Simply asking colleagues, how are you? Helps greatly, which is very true. Thank you very much for these answers. Here's one. When I was a supervisor, I told my staff that I didn't finish that. I'll go through that again. When I was a supervisor, I told my staff that we were people first and employees second, excellent. And being human helps win people. That's very, very true. Sometimes all it takes is for someone to be made to feel visible, you know, to be treated like a human being, you know, and it goes a long way. You can imagine from a work environment, Mr. James ended up impacting the home environment as well. Thank you very much. Can we have the second question? Thank you very much for those questions. How else would we foster human acts in a work environment? How else would we foster human acts in a work environment? Let's move on with the quest, the answers. How else would we foster? Yes, yes, yes. Take an interest in each other, very, very good. And their journey, their career, you know, this is really, really good. Thank you so much. And recognize and acknowledge people, personal lives outside of work, which is very, very good. That is very, very true. It's, it's not just about what we are able to see at work and what people are able to contribute, but even where they are coming from. Thank you so much. In a team setting or in a meeting, it is important to acknowledge each person and their input. I like to, uh, I like to go to everybody. Let me just go back slightly. I like to go around the room to ensure everyone has an opportunity to speak very good because sometimes we like gluing ourselves to computers and because this is the age where most of the work is uh, online then we cease to recognize that there are other human beings around thank you very much for these uh, answers very very brilliant answers and people are more than their job description very good well stated thank you so much develop relationships yeah with everybody instead of focusing on mistakes you know, start by appreciating the 90% they have done right before we can talk about correcting mistakes. Very, very correct. So you see, there's so much, actually, we can go on and on. But I've got a last question that I want to ask as well. So what are the consequences of zombifying humans in a work environment? 
what are the consequences of zombifying humans in a work environment? Low performance and attrition, good, very good. Thank you so much, Keokora. Others? Employee disengagement, very good. Toxic environment, who wants to work in such an environment? And I ask, I ask, you know, I ask if they would like to join and, in, and include getting to know one another brings people closer and develops great culture in an environment and lack of buy-in. Yeah, that's true. And when they don't buy in, then you are alone as a, as, as a leader. So in the US, in most areas, we have a full employment economy. People live if they feel unappreciated. That's very true. Thank you. So we need to appreciate people. Negativity is contagious. It gives birth to more negativity. Thank you so much. I think Giri, that's, that's, that's enough. Thank you so much for these contributions. Uh, these are really, really good. We can move on to the next slide there. So the value of humanizing employees. I think even from our discussion, we've seen that there's value in humanizing individuals. You know, when we recognize them as beings, you know, like ourselves. Uh, and and, and I, I remember one time doing another webinar uh, somewhere where I, I was looking at, you know, some of these jobs are like acting, you know, it, it's like you put on an acting face as you are walking to, to work or as you get to work, you put on an acting face. All right, I'm a, I'm a leader now. And then you change who you really are. And, you know, and, and that acting face changes you uh, completely and begin to act according to the script. And in most cases, it's the job descriptions that we have. We want to stick to the latter, you know, and the element of being sort of like scissors because all we are doing there is just a character, like a character in a movie, you know. And we become unbelievable. We don't even belong, you know, and issues of benevolence are nowhere. But when we be, be, begin to act as human beings, this element of being, these values are important, where we are, you are believed even when you are saying something and people can actually buy in also into the goals of the organization. They feel they belong to the organization. It's not your organization, you know, where leaders tend to say, my people, my people, they are not your people. You know, you all are employees in that environment or in that work environment. So Immanuel Kant argued that everything has either a price or a dignity. Whatever has a price can be replaced by its equivalent. Wow, what is above all price has no equivalent, but has dignity. You see, dignity is very important. Humans have got dignity. So valuing the individual, like we also were able to see in the responses that were given is very, very important. So our distinctive uniqueness is our unique combination. And that is important. I see dignity in their unique, you know, when you, I'm able to see the dignity in their unique genius. Remember we looked at this earlier on, a package of their talents personal strengths, acquired skills, their knowledge, unique backgrounds. We have said that, we have also seen that in the responses where we are not only interested in what they're doing in the work environment, but also you know, outside the work environment, their education, their careers, their stories. What kind of stories do they tell? You know, Stories are actually very, very rich. When we begin to listen to some of these stories, you discover they are so unique, but that uniqueness, when we come together as human beings, that uniqueness brings about, you know, something that just gels us all together, okay? So if honored, that's humanizing and that is inclusiveness. We need to honor everybody. It doesn't matter what kind of a job and what kind of a level that they have in that organization. We can move on. And so, um, Patrick Trotter tends to say that existence precedes essence, and I'm sure you are going to agree on that one because that means that the most important consideration for individuals is that they are human. You know, that's important. They are human, just as human as the leader is. That's how important and human that individual who is called an employee is. So independently acting as responsible, a whole conscious being, 
that's existence. So rather shift from the objectification of people, you know, this element of labeling of people as stereotypes, followers, subordinates, human resources, or human capital. I've written a book on followers, and I'm actually uh, uh, looking at the, the second edition because I'm removing certain of these concepts or terms like followers because they tend to dehumanize individuals. These are my subordinates. And already you've spoken volumes there, you know. So even as human resource uh, people, we need to begin to look at concepts that are rather inclusive. I know one of the things that we are looking at at the moment in human resource, uh, human resource is teamwork, you know, where you just have team leaders and team members because, you know, this whole thing of tearing one out, it's not inclusive at all. It creates a, an artificial kind of environment in a workplace. So the mechanistic stage, like I indicated, it has gone and it has died with its inhuman principles of categorizing people, putting them in boxes, slicing people, dicing them, isolating them, objectification, you know, and all that. We need now to unbox people, allow them to be human, you know, self-empowering. I've been at a workplace where even making a cup of tea was an offense. You know, we would even be told that when you are walking out and you move out before, you know, your time to leave uh, the job, there is a place where I can actually see, you know, heavily monitored, you know. I think that is not how we need to work. We are human beings. I think that is the most important thing. We can move on. So one of the things that came out of uh, our conversation or the dialogue that we had uh, as a team that uh, had this was this aspect of generative, creating a work environment as a generative place of intelligence, you know, where they, you come together, you know, there's co-creating, there's innovation, you know, there's uh, possibilities, you know, dialogues are very, very rich. And I've sat in kind of dialogue meetings where so much has come up. Ideas about journals have come up. Ideas about books have actually been contributed because of what people are able to contribute. Uh, Dr. Justin from Zimbabwe has insisted that you know, when we have this kind of generative place of intelligence, you know, it, it brings about this element of adapting job descriptions, customizing training programs, because we're dealing with human beings, you know, considering people's strengths and their talents when assigning projects, you know, listening and hearing everyone before making decisions about them. It's about them. It's not about you. You know, and it's not just about the talents. It's not just about the knowledge, the skills they are bringing to the table. It is about them because they are the ones that are carrying this knowledge, which is making sure that the organization meets its goals, embedding and manifesting human principles and values into the fabric of the organization. I'm telling you, if this is done, when we do that, we create an environment that everybody is happy to work in. And so we need to also begin to consider making leaders human again. You know, organizations need to take a, a systematic emergent approach to humanizing the workplace. And some of the issues that are put there, you know, when we have this, you know, this whole thing of a generative place of intelligence is those issues that are put up uh, out there. If you can also be able to read them, I'm sure you've read them, a high purpose, a higher purpose, what are we really there for? Generative dialogues, you know, bring about connections, you know, we are, we are able to listen to the stories of people, you know, and we are able to, to you know, to see certain fears that people might have, you know, we, we sort of like begin to, you know, to, uh, to undress ourselves because then this whole thing of being afraid of revealing who we really are comes to an end because we see that there's friendship that is also being developed as a result of these uh, generative uh, talks. We can, we can actually move on. So wh wh why are we supposed to be humanizing the work environment, you know? Because while we while humanizing a work environment, it takes time and effort. It's not something that probably you can go back to your work environment and you know it's abracadabra and and it's there. No, the returns are really really good. It's something that will require effort. It's something that will require time. It's something that will require um, you know uh, one just wanting to do it because if that is not there, 
then it will not actually take place. But you know, some of the good returns are the ones that are put up there, ingenious, you know, where people are able to say, I've got it. And I know when I'm sitting down with my friends and we're having these dialogues, that's one thing because something finally becomes clear and you have the aha moment. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. Oh, good, this is it, I've got it, you know. And, and people become healthier, you know, stress about wake, you know, comes to an end because you move certain priorities that are so stringent and you cannot actually do anything until those priorities are met. Unless if that means breaking the whole environment, uh, work environment, but you know, we need to consider a healthier employee. If the, if the, the employee is not healthy, then we cannot expect the best out of them. And, and as a result, when we do humanize the work environment, productivity. We were also told, I think the responses that we got, we saw people were able to say improves performance and people are happier. You know, you wake up home, put your feet on the floor, you begin to sing because you're happy you're going to work. You're going to meet individuals, friends, you know, and then we become more engaged. We want to participate as much as possible. So that is important. So one of the things that we need to look at is build empathy and understanding in the work environment. That is being human. We can move on. Now I say that it's, it's an OD uh, mandate. We know what OD is. Organization development is very important. Its values actually are human in nature. And because they are human in nature, why that organization development is quite important here and we can never do uh, without it. So it is about building the capacity of organizations in order to change and improve the overall productivity and efficiency of the organization. You see that in organization development where there's development improvement, reinforcing of these different strategies and structures as well as the processes for the human resource. You know, it brings about you know, the, the training and development, research and development and, and all these issues that is organization development. And that is why it is a mandate. If we are going to humanize the work environment, organization development needs to be considered in every organization. It's, yes, there's human resource, yes, there's human uh, development, but above that is organization development. We can move on. And because one of the things we shouldn't forget is that organization development actually also is looking at elevating humanity and you know, bringing the presence of the human systems. Okay, so we are saying it, 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 it is a process, it's a scientific process actually that enables organizations to build and sustain a new state of the kind of organization that is desired. And from those uh, uh, boxes, you can see the co-creation issues, the co-visionaries, you are sharing the visions. You know, you become co-developers, you become co-innovators. And what is the result? Growth, 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 and change agents. You become transformers and sustainability agents because what we are doing is supposed to be sustained. So one of the questions, I think the last question I was talking about zombifying workers, you know, um, I've, I've written an article where I was looking at, uh, you know, leaders that are leading zombies. And it's very unfortunate because you find this is happening in a lot of organizations. People are just there because like in Zambia, what we normally say is I just go to that workplace because I need to put food on the table. I need to feed my family. I need to take my children to school. And that's why I'm going to that, to that workplace because as far as they are concerned, they're dehumanized, you know. So the attitude of the workers as human is crucial. Because if we remove that, we remove their humanity from an individual, they cease to be active. And zombies are not active. They only become active. If you as the owner of those zombies, click your finger, then they wake up. Then you are able to tell them, you do this, you do this. And you see the element of micromanaging there. Human beings are not zombies. They are not dead. They don't need to be awakened up. They do not need to run away from you. We made it to you open the door to, to, your, to, to your office. You know, you are a human being. So we cannot zombify people by making them inactive. These individuals you have employed, are, employed are, are intelligent human beings. There's innovation, there's creativity in them. They are, they, there's imagination. If we allow that to come out, our organizations are going to benefit a lot. So let's not zombify the workers that we have. 
let's humanize a work environment if we are to benefit from the, the, the talents that they have, from the passions that they have, from the skills, the knowledge that they have attained. So the work environment should be a generative place of intelligence, like we have said in the previous slide, a place where we are connecting and fostering co-creation. You know, it, because like I said, it's ideas that emerge from there, you know, and these ideas turn into wisdom that is gained through these generative processes that we have put in place, experimenting, creating, innovating, interrogating continues. And what do we have? Great things begin to emerge, great things that we begin to see improvement or the growth of that particular organization. So let us humanize the work environment. The next slide. So there I'm saying that uh, we're talking about teamwork, getting together, having these dialogues. You know, it's in teams that these things happen. If we are a team, then we can have these generative dialogues. And there comes out engagement, partnerships, collaborations, networking, and efficiency and effectiveness will be seen. So the, the, the performance of these employees is going to be informed by the different facets, which we have already talked about, because they begin to believe what they are doing and why their existence is important there. They feel belong, that they belong to that organization, that whatever they are contributing is towards the good of that organization as well as them, not necessarily the, 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 the organization itself and the, 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 the owner of the business. You know, and, and these issues of behaving, their behavior changes, you know, issues of capability, climate that supports behavior, the clarity of the purposes of why they are there, strategies, okay, strategic goals of the establishment are also seen as important. And what comes out is trust is expected to produce efficiency. Because as a leader, when you stand up to speak, you are trusted because you've considered them as part and parcel of that organization. We can move on. So let's begin to see the human in every employee, which can be superseded by pressure to ensure that hard work and work alone is done. We need to move away from that. We need to move away from micromanagement, impositions of policies on people. Policies should have a human face because they are meant for those individuals, eliminating the boundaries within which they are supposed to function. You know, it, engagement and commitment and loyalty will be something that will be very important. So words matter. You know, some of the words that we use, you're just my subordinate. You're just an employee here. You're just a human resource. You know, yes, there may be human resource, but the way we speak can turn those human resources into just objects. Organizations need to reconsider words used in addressing and dealing with the people in the, in the team. So it's people's best right to be honored. It's people's best right to be respected. It's people's best right to be acknowledged like Mr. James was acknowledged. And you saw the reaction that came about due to that uh, recognition that he was given as a human being. And so, I'm going to allow you now to ask as many questions as possible. Already you have, it has been shared there that the question and, uh, and, and, question and answer session uh, will begin and I'm allowing you to begin to do that. If you see that picture there, let humans be humans. It's not wrong to drink a cup of tea. It's not wrong to hear them conversating. They are not wasting time. They are actually just human. I think when we are able to trust each other, and then we know what we really are supposed to be doing in a work environment. So we can have the questions in the Q and A. So again, you, you can so actually guide us there. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation, Dr. Mashibwe. Uh, we have a couple of questions here. Uh, Deveda Michelle asks, how can organization development or professionals build a business case for business leadership to support or see the value in embedding humanizing the work environment principles into talent practices, acquisition, recruiting, work assignments, development, and succession planning. Thank you and great presentation. 
Thank you. So how can organization development professionals build a business case uh, for business leadership? You know, one of the things that is actually quite crucial is the self in leadership. I think it really needs to begin by leaders seeing themselves, looking at themselves. I like this song that was sung uh, years ago by Michael Jackson. And he said that uh, I'm looking at the man in the mirror, you know, and, and, and that has left a lot of questions. Immediately you look into the mirror, who are you seeing as a leader? Because immediately you begin to see yourself, you will see a human being. And that is where this business case or professional case that we're talking about needs to begin from. Because when it starts from you understanding the self in you, the self in the leader, then you see the self and the human in another person. And, and, and someone has said here, alternatively, which words would you suggest HR uses instead of employee or staff? And I'll be very happy to actually be able to contribute to this kind of words, but you need to understand that these are uh, terms that are debatable. They are actually very critical and they can actually raise a lot of contention among people, but it is through the dialogues you know, that we can actually be able to understand what kind of words do we need to refer to one another. Uh, I, I just shared on my LinkedIn uh, about a research that I'm actually doing at the moment about the, 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 the term maids, you know, the research is about these maids. And one of the things that has come out and has emerged from this research, which came from the so-called maids themselves, is that the word maid is actually dehumanized. They, are, they feel so dehumanized immediately they are called maids. You see, and because it is coming from them, they've actually been able to state what would be the right words or the right term to be used, you know, for you. And they've come up with very, very good uh, concepts. And I would actually be able to say, let's go back to our environments. Let's go back to our organization, our companies, our institutions, and ask the people that we are with, what would be the best terms to use? Because again, these might be contextualized or localized. For instance, in Zambia, it might be something else. You know, in certain places, you find people prefer using boss to call their leaders. And when you try to find out why they like using boss, they'll give you a very good explanation for that. But we need to be very careful that we don't come up with terms that begin to box people, begin to label people. So I, 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 would, I would be happy to give some of these uh, terms, but I would prefer that we go back to our organization and get that from the people we are working with and understand how would they better be addressed. Thank you, Dr. Mishabwe. Uh, another question comes from Janet, Janet McNally. Uh, she asks, managers I talk with are usually concerned about employees taking advantage of them if they are not totally focused on achieving work goals. How do you see this? Very, very true. I've, I've done the same and uh, uh, that is something that seemed to be the focus of the, the leaders because what they want to see is work done. And that is very important. What they want to see are uh, the, the key performance indicators met. What they want to see is, uh, is performance that the organization is moving according to what it set out to achieve at the beginning of the year. And if we are not careful, like the question states, if we are not careful, we cease to see the human being. We go back to the mechanistic stage where what we want to see is just wake, 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 wake. And at the end, you end up with individuals who are stressed, individuals who are ill, individuals who are failing to perform, individuals who are failing to meet their performance indicators. You know? So leaders need to begin to dehumanize where they begin to see humanity in the people they are working with, the team members that they are working with. Thank you. Uh, another question is in the current climate of layoffs, how can we encourage humanized work environment, specifically in profit-focused organizations? I think there's so many strategies that companies are putting in place. Uh, that a lot of companies I've seen and I've read a lot of research where companies are coming up with uh, time in their workplace where they you know, deliberately create a table where you can go and have um, dialogue with others over a cup of tea, over pizza, 
you know, over anything that can actually bring the employees uh, together. And, and because of this disengagement, the current climate actually is one which is very, very uh, delicate. And, and it has seen a lot of people actually leaving organizations. And the statistics are actually able to demonstrate that, that because of the remote working, people have failed to go back to their usual or the normal, you know, the, the new, the old normal. It has seen a lot of uh, attrition. People have left uh, their, their, their jobs and all that. But there's so much that can actually be brought back, you know, where, you know, people have ended up with gyms or a crash uh, in, the, in the work environment so that the woman can still be able to go and breastfeed the baby at the crash and uh, within a, a, a specific period of time and can still be able to contribute. So these are things that are not far-fetched. These are things that can actually be done, but there must be a will. There must be a deliberate will to be able to inject these things or initiatives to create a human environment. And appreciating some of these weaknesses that people have, you know. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, on a related question, uh, this is uh, how, it, how can we embed the idea of a humanized work environment into the company culture? What are some of the best practices that employers, managers, and employees should follow? Okay, the, the, a culture is something that uh, should be developed by everybody in the work environment. It shouldn't be something that is just uh, fostered by uh, fostered by one person, but it should be something that you know comes together, contributed to by each and everybody in the in the, in the work environment. Because when that happens then that is when the actual definition of what culture is comes about because this is how we do things here because everybody else has contributed and they're part and parcel of that. So can I get the second part of the question? I think I missed it. I can't see it here. Uh, yes, the second part of the question is um, what are some of the best practices that employers, managers and employees should follow? Okay, one of the things that I think I would actually begin with is being deliberate, you know, it's, it's really being deliberate. And I, I think I'll still go back to the previous uh, 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 question that was given as to some of the, how would we want to, you know, call these uh, team members, what would be the best uh, concepts or terms that we can actually use. I think when we become deliberate and we are, we have actually created an environment that is engaging, generative, and we can have these dialogues and what have you. These elements that are being asked for can actually emerge out of such kind of dialogues. Okay, I wouldn't like to begin to impose and say, this would be the best things to do. And I, it would be a very good thing to do. And I wish we had a kind of environment, you know, where we are physically meeting because then the, the, the discussions, you know, the, the, the dialogues that we would have would be so rich and we can actually end up coming up with a number of these concepts or a number of these strategies or a number of actually these initiatives. So I think it is when we become so deliberate, when we allow this culture where people can actually be able to speak, where people can actually be able to, to ask questions, where people can actually be asked, you know, to be human again, that these actually deliberate ways of doing things can be able to image. I hope I've answered and that that would be satisfying enough. Thank you, Dr. Mashubri. Uh, we have time for one last question. Uh, this question, uh, yes, uh, this question is, I feel like automation hinders humanizing the work environment. If humans can be replaced in specialized positions, what is the incentive of organizations to humanize the work environment? Yes, yes, that, that's, that's a very, very good question, like, like any other question that has been, uh, that has been asked. And uh, a lot of people tend to ask me this question um, when I speak about humanizing uh, the workplace, because obviously these automations, uh, it is claimed that they will take over a number of uh, jobs for humans. And uh, one of the things that I tend to say is, I don't think a human being will ever be completely replaced these automations. And I don't think that artificial intelligence will completely uh, take out a human being in a work environment. I don't think so. 
but the mandate remains with us that as we remain in these work environments, that we make everything possible as much as possible to ensure that we humanize, not automating the workplace, but humanizing the same humans that remain in that organization need to be able to know that they are humans, they are not robots, but they are humans and they cannot actually be changed into these robots. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Mishibwe, and thank you so much for the great presentation. And uh, off to thank you, you so Abby. Much. Thank you, Sagan, and thank you, Dr. Mashupe. Most of all, thank you all for your active participation. So um, I believe that all the conversation happened in the chat and Q&A session, all those are very beautiful. And through this session, I believe that we are empowered to transform the zombies into human beings this time. And it was really a pleasure being with all, you all of you today. On behalf of our ODNC Workforce Education Program, we hope you think this webinar is helpful. If we did not get to your question, please send us an email or reach out to the presenter directly via email. For the future webinar, we would like to hear your feedback on today's webinar. Please take the survey using the link in the chat box. It takes less than three minutes. Our next webinar is about Global Teacher Network, preparing a global workforce on February 24th from 12 to 1 p.m. Registration for all events can be found on our website. You can also find us on our social media platforms such as Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. Again, thank you everyone for joining us today, and we hope to see you soon.